Calling all cars. A copyrighted program transcribed and dedicated to the prevention of crime. Calling all cars. Attention all cars. Broadcast 168. Investigate a reported robbery at service station. Corner of 3rd and B Streets. Get out there right away. That is all. Gordon. Truth is often stranger than fiction. No one is as certain of this old adage as the person who turns the pages of the official records of crime. Here are uncovered those quirks of the human mind which, when translated into action, make crime so puzzling, not only to the average citizen, but even to the trained police officer. Mr. Average Citizen is prone to shrug his shoulders and let the explanation come from the police. It is astonishing with what cunning the criminal hides his intents. Always the police find it, uncover it, and the case is solved. It is this kind of case we are about to hear. A cunning killer, the motive hidden, actions that only a psychiatrist could explain. A strange crime indeed. But to tell you more of it would be to take away interest from this extraordinary story. So let us now listen to The Laughing Killer. late afternoon, March 7th, 1936. Inside the San Mateo Police Headquarters, there is little to relieve the monotony of the day. Broken only by the deep hum of some casual fly, silence occupies the room. Suddenly, the phone on the robbery details desk begins ringing, rings until answered. San Mateo Police, robbery detail. Uh, this is Joy Seltz. I've just been held up. Where? Over at the gas station. You know, over here on 3rd and B. Yeah. Three mugs with guns walked in and took 13 bucks out of the cash register. How long ago was this? Uh, just a few minutes ago. Okay, we'll send someone over. You can tell them all about it. Yeah, they'll be right over. All right, boys. Get on over there. Now, Sells, if you'll just give us the description of these men and fill out this report, we'll see what we can do for you. Sure. They were all dressed about the same way. All had overcoats. You said something about guns, too, didn't you? Yeah, they, they all had guns. Notice what kind of guns? I know, uh, no, I, I didn't. Uh, what color were their overcoats? Uh, color? Yeah. Well, uh, let me see. I think they were gray. Uh, yes, they were gray. Could you identify them? The men, I mean, if you saw them again. Well, I, I don't know. Uh, they didn't wear masks, did they? No, that, that is... Uh, I don't think so. You don't think so? No, uh, I'm sure they didn't. I couldn't see them very well. Why not? Well, they had their coat colors too, and, you know, high over their faces. And they wear hats? Yeah. Both of them? Yeah. How about the other? 
the other. Yeah, you said there were three. Did the third wear a hat? Uh, oh, uh, yes. Uh, rather, uh, no. Uh, uh, he didn't wear a hat. What did he look like? I, um, I can't seem to remember very well. Uh, he was sort of dark. Uh, you don't seem very sure of all this, young fella. First you say there were three of them, and then you say both wore hats. You can't give us a description. You're sure you were held up? Yeah, I, I was. Well, then what did the men look like? Well, oh, wait a minute. Let me think a bit. Were they blonde, dark-haired, red-headed, what? They were all sort of dark hair. All three of them? Uh, yeah, I'm sure of that. How could you tell that? You said they had hats on and wore their coat collars turned up. Oh, well... Come on, young fella. Give us a straight story on this. Well, you mean you, you, you don't believe me uh, that I was robbed, I mean? Hardly. But, but I'm on the level. Come uh, on, this isn't getting anywhere. I, uh... Oh, all right. As a matter of fact, uh, I wasn't robbed. That's just what I figured. Now, what's the idea? Uh, I needed some dough, so I framed this. Uh, I only took 13 bucks. You mean you hoped we'd believe that story of yours and spend a lot of time looking for three birds who didn't even exist while you spent the money. Is that it? Why, well, I didn't care whether you fellas ever looked for them or not. Just as, so long as I got the 13 bucks. Where do you live? Oh, uh... I acquired a house in uh, Woodside. I live there. What do you mean, acquired? I got it in a trade deal, you know, uh, swapping things around. Who'd you get it from? A woman, Mrs. Uh, Ada French. She traded it to me for an automobile and some lots up on Skyline Boulevard. You got a deed to it? A deed? Yeah, a certificate of ownership. Well, no, I haven't. I think we'd better take this fellow into the station, Ed. The more he talks, the less I believe. Here, too. Come on, Sells. You're going to take a little ride with us. Oh, listen. Uh, can't you boys just sort of forget all this and let me go? I, I wouldn't pull anything like it again. Not a chance. You've already pulled enough. Matter of fact, I wouldn't be surprised to see the judge give you 30 days for this trick. Come on, put on your hat. And for his attempted hoax, Jerome Sells draws just that. 30 days in the San Mateo jail. But during the first week of his stay there, he spends his time laughing one minute and telling all sorts of strange stories the next. Finally, after 12 days of his sentence have passed, the police call Sheriff McGrath of San Mateo County. Tell him about their storytelling prisoner. His curiosity aroused, Sheriff McGrath decides to have a talk with Sells. Sells? They tell me you've been spinning some tall yarns over at the jailhouse. All right. I don't know as you'd call them yarns, Sheriff. What are you in for? Oh, I needed some dose. I framed little hoax over at the service station. Took some cash out of the till and reported it as a whole. Uh, how about this house you talked about? The one in Woodside? I understand you got it through some sort of a trade. Yeah, that's right. What were the details of that trade, so? Oh, they're kind of mixed up. Uh, take a long time to tell you. Oh, that's all right. I've got the time. <laughs> so since you're in no hurry to get anywhere, and not for a while anyway, let's hear him. Well, uh, I got the house from a woman who owned it. Traded her some property I had up in Oregon in a car for it. Mm -hmm. What was her name, so? Uh, French. Ada French. Where is she now? Uh, where is she now? <laughs> Boy, that's a hot one. <laughs> well, what's so funny? Well, it's just one of those things, Sheriff. She ran up with a Bulgarian army officer. I don't know where she went. Well, I still don't see anything so funny in that. That's because you don't know her. His name was Berenwich. How do you spell that, Sheriff? What? Berenwich? Yeah. Why, I don't know. B-A-R-O-N, uh, bitch, I guess. Uh, you say he was a <laughs> Bulgarian? Yeah. An army officer? <laughs> yeah, at least. That's what he said. I see. Now, Sills, there's another little thing you might be able to explain for me. Where'd you get all the money you've been spending lately? Huh? I've learned that you've been spending a lot of cash lately. Where'd you get it? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, Ada transferred her bank account to me before she ran off with the guy. Oh, she did? Yeah. Why? Why? That's right, Why? Oh, I guess because she kind of liked me. I knew her pretty well, and she just decided to let me have it. That's all. You don't know, have any idea where she is now? Nope, not the faintest, Sheriff. Somewhere with that Berenwich guy. <laughs> well, you're pretty happy about all this, aren't you, sir? Well, not exactly happy. I get a kick out of the old lady running up with a Bulgarian army officer and leaving all her dough to me. <laughs> Why wouldn't I? Why, of course. Why wouldn't you? She's goofy enough to do that. I got a right to have a laugh out of it, haven't I? Why, sure. You can laugh all you want. There's only one thing. I'm afraid you'll have to do your laughing over in our jail for a while. Just until I find out a little more about your elderly lady friend, Mrs. French. Uh, you don't mind her? Me? Mind? No. Go right ahead. <laughs> I still think it's funny. <laughs> I get a big kick out of the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> So the mirth-stricken youth is placed in the county jail, and 
Sheriff McGrath sets out to find out a few more details of his association with the romantic Mrs. French. And accompanied by Deputy Sheriff Thomas Maloney, he questions the neighbors near the Woodside house. No, there never was anybody by the name of French lived around here. There was a Mrs. Ada Rice lived at the place you mentioned, but I never heard of a French. Sure, I knew Ada Rice. Knew her pretty well, too. I never could figure out where she went to. That young fellow that lives here now said she'd run off and got married. But that was nearly a year ago. I've often thought about her. She was a mighty fine woman, believe me. Yes, Sheriff, Mrs. Rice did transfer her bank account to this sales fella. No, she didn't come in herself, just did it by signature. Surely, if you want a copy of the transfer, you're more than welcome to him. I never did exactly understand the relationship between young Sells and Mrs. Rice, but it wasn't any of my business, so I didn't pay any attention to it. Now, here's what I want you to do. This piece of paper has a signature on it. You see him? Ada Rice. Now, here's another piece of paper with the same signature on it. I want you to tell me if they were both made by the same person. Mm-hmm. Let me see. Mm. No. No, I wouldn't say that they were made by the same person, Sheriff. This one here is a copy. Fairly good one, too, but not perfect by a long way. That's all I want to know. Come on, Tom. I'm anxious to see what our friend Sells can think up as answers to the questions we've found for him. Hello, Sheriff. Sells, Deputy Maloney and I have been asking a few questions. We're not exactly satisfied with the results. I want you to see if you can give us better ones. What are they? Well, in the first place, you told us that the woman you got that house from was named French. Is that right? Yep, that's right. And yet her name is Rice. Ada Rice. Now, why the phony name? I don't think I want to answer that one yet, Sheriff. Try another. All right. I've checked the copy of the bank transfer, and it's a forgery. What do you say to that? A forgery? That's right. <laughs> Are you going to tell me you didn't forge Ada Rice's signature? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you anything, Sheriff. Why should I? Because you're getting in deeper every time you tell one of your lies. It's liable to go pretty hard with you before this is over. That's why. Sorry, Sheriff. I don't feel like talking now. <laughs> Why don't you go out and find that Bulgarian army officer, Berenwich? Maybe he can tell you a few things. There's one more thing I'd like to ask you, Sells. The people who live out near your place tell me you've been seen in an automobile several times, driving it. Where's that car now? I give it to Ada. It was part of the trade. You go find Berenwich and Ada, and maybe you'll find the car, too. <laughs> All right. Take him back to his cell. I guess we'll have to get the real story from some other source. It's a sure thing I can't listen to this laughing hyena anymore. Take him away. Back at the Woodside house, McGrath gets a description of the missing car, has a bulletin sent out to all points to be on the lookout for it, then proceeds to delve into the laughing Jerry Sells' past. Two days later, a report comes in from Burlingame that the car has been located in a garage there. An immediate check with officials of that city brings to light the fact that it is the same car which several months back had been reported stolen from a Burlingame resident, that the owner had collected insurance on it at that time. And with this added twist to the already puzzling case, McGrath once again faces his prisoner, once again asks questions. You're in so deep right now, Sells. But the sooner you decide to talk, the better it's going to be for you. Now, what about this stolen car business? Well, what about it? Where'd you get it? I didn't. What do you mean by that? You didn't what? I didn't have a stolen car. I told you what happened to sure, mine. Sure, that and a lot of other things, too. But every time I check on your stories, they turn out to be lies. Oh, come on. Why don't you settle down? Get your feet in the ground. Tell me the straight on all this mess. No, I think I've said enough for a while. I don't feel like saying anything more. Sorry, Sheriff, but that's the way it goes. All right, Sells. Keep on making it tough for us. But you know you're being silly, don't you? Because as long as you refuse to cooperate with us, you're staying right here in jail. That's all right. <laughs> you find my friend, Berenwich, and then I'll tell you a lot of things. <laughs> a lot of things you never even thought of. <laughs> oh, take him back to jail. I'm getting tired of that <laughs> laughing. And back to his cell he goes, laughing at his hidden joke insinuating to his escort that he knows many things, but that he won't tell them yet. 
Sheriff McGrath, after a night of pondering the case, decides to try slightly different tactics. Accordingly, the next day, McGrath, Maloney, and another deputy take cells over to his house at Woodside. For several hours, they go over the house with him, asking questions, writing down the answers, then asking the same questions over again. Finally, McGrath begins a psychological experiment. Sit down, Jerry. Might as well take it easy. Are you going to stay here? Why, sure. Why not? I don't know. Only, uh, okay, I'll sit down. That's the idea. Make yourself comfortable. Be sure the place to do it, eh, Tom? Yeah. Soft seat, nice easy pillow. Really a great little spot. I guess you were pretty happy up here, Jerry. Yeah, I was. You live here when Mrs. Rice had the place? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, that's a great spot, all right. Wouldn't mind living here myself. Of course, there's only one thing about it. What's that, Sheriff? The flies. Never could stand a lot of flies buzzing around. Where do you see flies? Right outside the window there. A whole flock of them. Big bottlenecks. I can't see any. Boy, sure, I can see them. Hear them, too. Can't you, Tom? Sure. Eh, I don't like them. They're sort of, well, you know, unpleasant. Always buzzing around, looking for some place to sit down, get a meal. Yeah. Guess that's what those are looking for now. Stop talking about flies, will you? Yeah. Well, what's the matter with you, Jerry? You look kind of pale. Look at him, Tom. He's white as a sheet, isn't he? Yeah. Must be upset about something. That it, Stiles? No. No. There's nothing the matter with me. Only, will you lay off that talk about flies? Well, you're making a lot of fuss over a swarm of bottleneck flies, Jerry. How come they upset you so? Remind you of something? Yes. Cut it out. Well, why don't you tell us about it, Jerry? We'd like to hear it, wouldn't we, Tom? Sure. What's so important about a bunch of flies buzzing around, Sam? Please, I can't stand it any longer. The flies never hurt anyone's cells. Not badly, I mean. They just buzz around looking for food. Just the same as you or I. Only they're flies. We're not. All right, Sam. I'll tell you. I killed Ada. I killed her right here in this house. Now, will you stop talking about flies? Will you Where please? Where was Berenvich when you killed her? Berenvich? Oh, Berenvich. He... He was gone. And what did you do with Mrs. Rice's body after you'd murdered her? I, I can't talk anymore now. I killed her. That's all I can say. Now, will you take me out of here? Take me back to jail. Anywhere. Only let's get out of here. All right, Jerry. We'll take you back to jail. And you'll stay there until you get ready to tell us the whole story. So come on. Let's get going. I didn't have any intentions of killing Ada. It was a mistake on my part. An awful mistake. You see, Ada... Ada used to come into my gas station for gas and oil all the time. She got so she was coming oftener every week. And then she began asking me to go out to the house with her for dinner. Things like that. And you weren't? Naturally. What would you have done? I'm, I'm only human, aren't I? And she was older and... But what difference does it make? All this business has nothing to do with what happened that night anyway. I don't know why I'm telling you about go it. Go ahead, go ahead, Jerry. You can skip the more intimate details. What we want is how did you kill her? And what did you do with her afterward? Yeah... Yeah. I know what you want. I'll tell you. I went out to the house that night. When I got there, it was all dark. Inside the house, it was dark. So I unlocked the door. I had a key by then and went inside. It was so dark, I couldn't see anything, and I felt my way along until suddenly I felt something. Someone. I thought it was Berenwich. Go on, Jerry. You thought it was Berenwich? I thought it was Berenwich. And I decided to fix him. So I reached down in the fireplace and grabbed the poker. I could hear someone breathing right near me. And I swung the poker around in a circle. I hit something and I I, I heard a heavy fall. Then, I guess I, I went a little crazy because I remember kneeling down and beating it some more, beating it until the breathing stopped. Then I turned on the light and I discovered my mistake. It was Mrs. Rice. Yeah. And she was dead. I'd killed her by mistake. Where was Berenvich? 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 Ber oh, he, he wasn't there. He'd, he'd gone, I guess. You know, Jerry, it's a funny thing. Up to this point, I think you've been telling the truth. But as soon as you started fumbling around now, I, I have a hunch you're lying again. How about it? I told you I killed her, didn't I? I told you how I did it. Isn't that enough? No, I want two more things. Where's her body? And what about this baronet's person? I've talked enough. I'm not saying any more about anything. You can ask me questions till you're blue in the face, and the answer is no. I don't know. So once again, one moment laughing, one moment serious, Jerome Sells decides to close up, refuses to make any more statements to clarify the ones he has already made. 
But used to his ways by now, Sheriff McGrath instructs the deputies to return him to jail. Settles down to await the killer's next talking spell. And two days later, his patience is rewarded. When Sells asks to see him, sends word he is ready to talk. And in McGrath's office, a little later... Hello, Jerry. Sit down. Thanks. So you've decided to tell me the story. Is that right? Sure. I'll tell you, Sheriff. In fact, I'll do more than that. I'll show you how to get out to where she is. That's fine, Jerry, fine. I thought you'd see the light before long. Well, you know me, Sheriff. I've got to be in the mood before I'll talk. There's a stubborn streak in me somewhere, I guess, that makes me as mean as that devil sometimes. <laughs> I know that only too well by now. Yeah, <laughs> I guess you do. Anyway, you'll find her out the Boulder Creek Road, about 11 miles northeast of Saratoga. You're sure she's there? Why, I ought to be. Just before you picked me up, I took a ride out there and made sure. Come on. Let's go get her. I need the air. <laughs> And after a drive out the Boulder Creek Road, Sells suddenly points to a large clump of bushes, indicates it to be the hiding place. A moment later, Sheriff McGrath is in possession of the long-missing body of Mrs. Ada Rice. Loading it aboard the car, the group start back the road to the morgue, when suddenly the paradoxical Mr. Sells turns to the sheriff, asks a strange question. Say, uh, Sheriff, did you ever get the wire off that, uh, that other fella? Huh? What other fella? Oh, I forgot. I haven't told you about that, have I? Well, I guess not, Jerry. Well, I might as well. There's no reason why I shouldn't. I got that Baron Witch guy after all. You you mean you killed him too? Sure, why not? You see, he was in the house the night I killed Ada. And he knew I'd done it. So a little while afterwards, he started calling me up and asking for money. Said he'd tune me in if I didn't raise some cash for him. But I told him to keep out of my way or I'd get him too and he'd stop calling. You said you killed him? I did. Came back to the house one night, and when I walked in the door, there he was, sitting in a chair with a thirty-eight in his hand. Before I could do anything, he jammed it in at me, and I struggled with him. Pretty soon I got it. I hit him over the head a few times, and he fell down. Are you sure you're telling me the truth, Jerry? Sure. I'm giving you the straight goods, Sheriff. All right, go ahead. What'd you do then? Got some heavy bailing wire and wrapped him up in it. Then I found some hunks of lead, and I tied them on. Finally, I drove him out to the bridge and dumped him off. I figured he'd probably wash ashore by now. That's why I asked about the uh, wire. Well, I don't know, Jerry. It's getting so I don't know when to believe you and when not to. However, I've got an idea. And if I can promote it, we'll see how much truth there is in your story. What do you mean? Simply that I'm going to get in touch with Inspector Pigeon of Berkeley and ask him a favor. If he falls in with the idea, you're going to have a chance to try lying to the lie detector. I'm anxious to see how it comes out. Step on it, Maloney. A few days later, in Inspector Pigeon's office at Berkeley, Jerry Sells, the laughing killer, sits before a strangely constructed machine. Around his arm is a blood pressure winding. In front of him are numerous instruments for indicating changes of heartbeat, quickened pulse. Quietly, Inspector Pigeon asks the questions, watches his apparatus as it responds, false or true. Now, Sells, I, I want you to repeat what I say. Okay, Inspector, shoot the works. I want you to say... I did not kill Mrs. Rice. But, but I did. That's all right. You repeat what I said. Okay. I did not kill Mrs. Rice. Now, I'm going to ask you to notice that instrument hand in front of you, Sheriff. It has registered an uneven line during Sell's last statement. That indicates an increased heartbeat. Or, to our way of figuring, a lie. Now, Sells, will you tell us what you did to Baron Witz? Sure. I, I killed him. Hit him with a gun and tied him up with bailing wire. You notice the line, Sheriff? I do. It's wiggling all over the place. Naturally, the lie detector cannot be used as direct evidence. Its testimony is not acceptable in a court. But as far as we can go, the detector is telling us that this man is lying. Thanks a lot, Inspector Pigeon. Now, if you'll get cells out from under that machine, I'll take him back to San Mateo. He's probably lonesome for his jail cell by now. How about it, Jerry? <laughs> and once back in jail, Jerome Sell settles down to a surly existence, broken only by his spasmodic moments of laughter. And Sheriff McGrath, his case complete, turns the evidence over to District Attorney Gilbert Ferrell. On March 12th, 1936, Sell stands before Superior Court Judge Cotton pleads guilty to the crime. Then, before Judge Cotton pronounces sentence, Farrell makes a closing statement. Your Honor, at this time, I should like to recommend 
that the defendant be spared the extreme penalty. He has cooperated with the law throughout this trial. He's pled guilty, therefore saving a great deal of time and money for the county. He's also shown his willingness to cooperate by identifying the body of his victim, Ada Rice. And he's the only man who could have done this due to reasons you already know. However, I ask the court to make certain, if it sees fit to impose a life sentence, to make certain that Jerome Sells will spend the rest of his life in the penitentiary. And the only way to do this is to recommend that there be no parole. Thank you, Your Honor. Jerome Sells, stand and face the court. Are you ready at this time to have sentence passed on you? I, uh, I guess so, Your Honor. Then I sentence you to spend the rest of your natural life in San Quentin Penitentiary. Furthermore, I order that you be sentenced without benefit of a parole during your lifetime. <laughs> And just two months later from his cell in San Quentin, Jerome Sells turns the final page in his macabre story, brings to a close all conjecture about his second victim. <laughs> of course, that was all hooey. I never killed that Bulgarian army officer, Berenwich. As a matter of fact, there never was any Berenwich. I just made him up on the spur of the moment. <laughs> and did I get a lot of laughs out of that? Why, you guys never knew who you were. <laughs> <laughs> So ends Jerome Sell's almost unbelievable tale, and at the same time, so ends his career as a killer. The only motive ever discovered for his crime was his desire for Ada Rice's bank account, a small prize to gain when placed beside the sentence he received. There is no chance for him to obtain his freedom from some subsequent parole board, because his sentence, without benefit of parole, precludes that. Only death can free him from his cell. The police and the district attorney deserve great credit for their patience in uncovering the motive of the crime, the successive steps which finally led to the conviction and sentence. Crime does not pay. Thank you.